Thank you for joining us. I'm John Richter, president of Friends of the Jordan River Watershed. Friends of the Jordan is a conservation and environmental group located in northwest lower Michigan. The program you're about to see is on a subject that will affect every person in Michigan and something we all need to learn a lot more about before irreparable harm is done to our homes, communities, and environment. This subject is called fracking, or more accurately, deep shale slick water hydrologic fracking. It's a new method of extracting natural gas. A couple of years ago, after watching a commercial by T. Boone Pickens announcing vast reserves of natural gas right here in America, I was encouraged. At last, I thought, here was an abundant fossil fuel that burned cleaner than coal, could end our dependence on foreign oil, and provide good jobs for American workers. Then I learned about the devastating industrial scale process used to extract this natural gas, the effects it had on communities and the environment, and that it was being sold overseas. Now I'm not only discouraged, but alarmed. We have seen the environmental destruction fracking has caused in other states, and now it's come to Michigan. We think Michigan has far too much to lose by allowing this method of gas extraction to continue. But first we, under, we need to understand how fracking works and what its true costs are. A series of videos we have prepared are segments of a two-hour presentation by Dr. Anthony Ingrafia from Cornell University. Dr. Ingrafia is a world-renowned expert on natural gas extraction and provides us with a sound scientific explanation of fracking. This video should be well worth your time to watch. You can find much more information on this subject on our website at friendsofthejordan.org or another don'tfrackmichigan.org. Thanks for watching. So now that you've seen the cartoon and you've seen a still cartoon and a movie cartoon, I'm going to show you the real thing. Okay. So now we're in what did I know and when did I know it. Uh, contrary to what you think right now, I'm not as young as I used to be and look, but way, way back when I had all black hair and a lot of it, <coughs> I went on my first sabbatical. That's the boondoggles that professors get every six years, you know. Uh, I wasn't boondoggling, I went to work in the unconventional gas program at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, one of the weapons labs out in California. And there was an unconventional gas program funded by the Department of Energy. So we've known for a long time that there was gas in the shales out here. Okay. And we were working on it back then. So uh, I'm going to show you some images from the research and development I was doing there for a couple of reasons. One, to show you that the problems we're facing today, old problems, not new. The industry has known about them for 25 or more years, and they're still problems. They're gradually being addressed, gradually being solved, but they're not solved problems yet. That's my point. Okay, wrote a bunch of papers when I was out there. Here's one from 1987. Uh, this is extracted from that paper. Considerable quantities of natural gas are like tight, locked tightly into the eastern Devonian shales. In those shales, the gas is mostly drained from the natural fractures, which tend to be vertical and spaced a few meters apart. To recover the gas, it is necessary to stimulate the rock reservoirs, that's using hydraulic fracturing, and rock reservoirs already contain natural fractures, and this makes it difficult to predict the effects of induced fracturing. So we set out on a research program to try to understand what those difficulties were and to try to quantify them and see if we could use computer simulation and knowledge of the rock to figure out how best to conquer those problems. Okay. How many people here have ever done finite element analysis? <laughs> okay, how many people here have ever, have ever used a supercomputer? How many people have ever done computer simulation of complex fracturing processes? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm really proud of this picture. It's from a 1987 <laughs> paper, and believe it or not, this, the computer we used to do the analysis I'm going to describe was at that time the single most powerful computer in the world. It's about as powerful as the computer in my cell phone right now. 
But anyway, here's the picture. Here's a well bore, right? Here's the casing. Here's the cement. This is the rock. Every one of those lines is a joint, a pre existing fracture. And we asked the computer what happens if we inject a certain amount of fluid at this point through a perforation. And I'll show you a picture of a perforation in a minute. It goes through the cement, fractures the rock, gets into the first joint, and it has a decision to make. Do I go left or do I go right? Well, it depends. Depends upon the pressures and stresses in the rock, depends upon the characteristics, the flow characteristics of the joint, the permeability of the rock. And so the computer model says, well, it all went this way, but when it got here, this is Main Street and Elm. It has to decide whether to go left, right, or straight, and some of it went that way, so you got the point. What we have is a network of flow fields. It's like a traffic pattern, right? If, all, if 100 cars leave this street at this time, where do they wind up? when they all have opportunities to make left turns, right turns, or go straight. The problem here is that this wound up being an unpredictable problem. We concluded in this paper that it's nonlinear chaos. What that means, for those of you who don't know, wait a minute, some, you told me these people all, no, they don't know? Okay, a, a characteristic of a nonlinear chaotic problem is, one, is this, a slight change in any of the conditions in the problem results in a big change in the answer. That's not a good position to be in. <laughs> it makes your computer models virtually useless. They're fun, and you write papers about them, but they're not practical. So we couldn't use this computer model to tell Schlumberger where the fluid was going to go. And that's generally true. Okay. Fast forward five years, still working for Schlumberger, but now we're doing actual physical testing. Schlumberger had a computer model that would predict how every one of those perforations Boom. Remember those little perforations you saw in the movie? Each one of those perforations spawns a crack. And Schlumberger had a computer model that said the cracks should start at this location, at this time, and take this shape and propagate this fast. Let's see how good the computer model is. That's called validation. It's a very important concept in, in engineering. Anybody can write down an engineering model or theory, and it's worth nothing unless it can reproduce what you can see. That's called the validation process. So it's always necessary to do physical experiments to show that your computer models have merit. So we drilled a hole, just like the movie said. We put a casing in it, steel pipe. We cemented the casing. We perforated the casing in the cement and the rock. And then we injected colored fluid as pressurizing hydraulic fracturing fluid to see how the cracks evolved over time. So here you go, there aren't very many people who have ever seen these things. We broke open the rock when we were done, so we broke open this big piece. And here's the casing. This gray area is the cement. Okay. These pink colored areas are fractures, natural hydraulic fractures. That hole is a perforation. Here's another one here, here's a perforation in the cement. And there's the overall picture, and what we found out was that the computer model said that the cracks should all be semicircular or elliptical, and they should all propagate at the same rate, and we should have a symmetric result. And we didn't, but that's because we're working in a natural material where there are variations in the properties point by point. That wasn't man-made sandstone, it was natural sandstone. So even though we could control in a laboratory all the pressures that we were applying to that block, we were squeezing it in three directions with the same stresses that would exist down hole we still didn't get results that perfectly matched the computer models. Close. Okay, so computer models say that. And that's what we got. Reasonable. But that's just to show you that I work with Schlumberger. Okay, Schlumberger is still working on the same problem. <clears throat> I'm really proud of some of my students who went to work for Schlumberger and Exxon. And um, one of them once got the cover of a magazine, which is very famous. It's called the Journal of Petroleum Technology. <clears throat> if you're anybody in the oil and gas industry, you want to get published in this journal, just so you know. <coughs> okay. So <clears throat> I'm not bragging that we got the cover, although that's quite an accomplishment in 1989. What was funny to me and ironic today and relevant to you as residents of Pennsylvania who hear things about methane migration and frac fluid migration is that that's not a new problem. 
So when I went to scan this cover, I put this magazine in my scanner, and before I closed the scanner, I looked at the back cover. And I'm going to show you what the back cover is. It's a full page ad from Schlumberger. Gas migration control, a comprehensive approach. Here's your casing, here's your cement. If you got migration through the cement or along the cement bond line, you call Schlumberger and they bring out the golden fingers. <laughs> and they squeeze that cement shut so that the migration is cut off. How's that for humor? Pretty sick, huh? Anyway, uh, the point I'm making here is this is an old problem and it will never go away. It is impossible to guarantee in any well, whether it's a water well, conventional gas well, oil well, that your cement job is ever going to be perfect. There's just too many complexities involved. Witness what happened in the Gulf of Mexico this summer. That's a, you know, a multi-billion dollar well, and they fouled it up big time because they had a faulty cement job for many reasons. Okay, so that's 1984, 1989. You might be thinking, and Graffi is getting kind of long in the tooth. Maybe he's been out of it too long, and by now they've solved all these problems. I want to convince you that they haven't, but they're still working hard. So uh, here are a couple quotes from pen papers. Here's a paper from 2008 by a, this is the Society of Petroleum Engineer. This is a well-known guy who works for a well-known company. This is from his paper. I'll let you read it. The point he's making here is after 60 years, since 1947, the invention of hydraulic fracturing, we still don't really know exactly how to control everything or predict everything, but that's to be expected. Moving fast forward to 2009, another well-known uh, oil and gas industry expert. Although our computing tools have improved, the supercomputers are a lot faster now. And if you ever go to a frac site, has anybody here ever been on a frac job? Okay you'll notice that there's always going to be uh, one van over in the corner and inside that van are a bunch of computers and a bunch of people with MS and PhDs and those computers are connected by satellite connection to Houston where they have the supercomputers running and they are running real-time computer simulations of the frack job as they're fracking. That's called prognosis, well prognosis. The idea is to predict what's actually happening down there and by monitoring what you can at the surface, pressure, flow rate, you figure out whether what your computer model said should happen is actually happening. Okay. So after computing tools have improved as an industry, we remain incapable of fully describing the complexity of fracture, reservoir, and fluid flow regimes. So the point I'm making here is that I'm making it over and over again, beating the proverbial dead horse. We don't know everything. The industry doesn't have complete control over what they're doing. They're working in an, un they're working in a natural environment that is not inside of a building in an industrial zone. They're working thousands of feet underground where they can't see what they're doing, hear what they're doing, taste what they're doing, touch what they're doing, or smell what they're doing. They rely on models that are imperfect. The models are imperfect and the information they feed into the models is imperfect. Will it get better? Yeah, they get smarter. 